And I was done with, I think, the first year when they came to me and said we had this project that they wanted us to do. Uh, in addition to the very large transformation we were doing corporate-wide across the entire rating agency, which is roughly a couple thousand people. Um, so uh, we were going, uh, in, in many ways, for content revolution, uh, being able to produce content in a, uh, a better way, uh, to drive a lot of efficiencies and capabilities that, that, I, that the firm was sort of needing to do to sort of get to the next generation. So I got this little project. It was quite small. Um, and uh, they wanted us to use, uh, there was a, someone in our, one of our business lines was an avid baseball fan uh, and had read uh, an article about how uh, papers are not really sending uh, writers anymore to uh, uh, some uh, to a great uh, deal of college baseball games. So they were using the box score to write uh, essentially what happened at the game, right? And that box score is uh, you know. It, and, uh, and, and so some, some PhD students picked up on, uh, on that use case uh, and, they, and there were a number of uh, NLG products that came to market there. People who are in the space know there are four dominant commercial products in the market. We picked one of them, um, but that really began our journey and uh, at that point I knew really nothing about NLG, uh, natural language generation, other than um, Stanford is coming up with stuff every day in the space. 
So it's MIT's or a host of other universities. So the market is changing daily, right? <coughs> Commercial products are, are based on PhD projects from probably a decade ago. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of uh, stagnation in the market itself. Um, but at the end of the day, um, what, we, what we want to do, you can't go buy, right? So as a byproduct of that, we're putting a person on the moon, Mars, whatever you want to call it, but it is something that potentially no one has done before. Um, and, um, and the reason I think that we think that that's important is ultimately uh, the, we live in a very small world. You know, there are only a handful of large rating agencies. Um, financial services is, um, can be quite small um, when it talks about you know, who, who has market leadership. Uh, and honestly, there is, if we don't do it, there will be someone who does. Um, Jeff Bezos is going to do it in the next five years. He's been very clear about his intentions in the journalistic space. Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is people buying uh, ratings on Amazon. Uh, and ultimately, there are probably five men and women in a garage somewhere that are trying to figure this out. And so, you know, we believe the level of disruption the potential is quite high. Right? <coughs> Next slide. Oh, there. Okay. So uh, what we did, and as I kind of indicated before, was we built uh, a, uh, we used TOGAF to understand um, what it is we were trying to do. Uh, and honestly, from a business perspective, we didn't exactly know. Uh, and uh, on the other side of it was we had a package that did a very specific thing, but it didn't do the whole thing, right? So we went through a process of understanding those capabilities uh, from a business perspective that we needed to do that were evolving through the project. Uh, and, and by the same token, um, we wanted to know uh, as well sort of how we can use this package and how can we devolve this package to sort of understand what we were going to be able to do. So what we, what we realized was, you know, we had to uh, acquire, uh, well, we had to acquire a set of data that we felt was going to describe that we were going to write about. Um, and that's really nine pieces of data over five years. It's literally 45 pieces of data that produces a four-page piece of content. Um, and uh, we, our machine who writes about those nine pieces of data and how they trend over a period of time. Um, so it, it ultimately, uh, Tomiak helped us get there. Essentially, we were very clear. What, what it really did was help us zero in on what was we were trying to do. It forced us to write manually the perfect report and then sort of look at sort of what were the elements of that perfect report that allowed us to write uh, a machine-written piece of research or a piece of, of content. So with that done, um, we uh, went to market. Uh, in the space that we were serving, it was highly successful. But there was an enormous amount of criticism on, um, even though it seemed like a leap forward, people really didn't get how this would help in their businesses and in many of the business lines. So, uh, and even, in the sort of the people who ultimately paid for it, you know, was this sort of a, a one and done niche type thing. You know, many of us felt that, no, this was going to be something that was going to be big for the company. And so, you know, we started to sort of roadshow it and, and try to sell it. Fortunately, there were some visionaries, including um, one of the, uh, our CEOs uh, of, of our rating business, the CEO of our rating business, who was sort of highly excited about it. Um, and so we got a lot of attention off of it, and um, uh, we kept we kept going. Now, what it, we, what that what this slide is telling us is that if you have these nine pieces of data and you spend seven seven figures, you can write a report 
report at scale. You can write content at scale. You can write thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of reports based on this small model. Uh, and there are no limits, right? It's very rule driven. It's based on a, a decision tree, a very large decision tree. It reorganizes the content uh, based on sort of the, the particular company's value performance. And ultimately, you get a somewhat unique report. If I feed the same nine data points in, I get 10 times, I get 10 different reports. It's got a very strong synonym engine, so it can sort of express itself in very unique ways. And, and honestly, it causes a lot of problems because what happens is I you write it once and you want to edit it and you want the machine to rewrite it, it's a completely different report. So you can't, you can't, you, you can't sort of uh, edit uh, effectively in that way. So, but what we came out of this with was a good view of what the tool does, why it does it, uh, insights that did not come out of the initial uh, architecture that we had thought of. Uh, we learned a little bit along the way, and it became <coughs> important to create the next target architecture, which was um, next slide. So what we realized was, if, if you look at the, the platform itself, is you have to go figure out, and this is what we did, this is one of the gaps that we had to plug, was you have to go figure out where your data is located, and if you're like us, your data is located everywhere, right? Um, there are different levels of consistency in data, um, and uh, because when you do a process manually, when you look at some data manually, and you're a highly trained uh, financial expert, you can sort of interpolate your way through holes in the data. Um, but with this, you can't, because the machine um, at this level is not interpreting, interpreting anything. So what we're able to do is start to look at a few things and start to disassemble. So when we built the first phase, uh, architecture, it had a lot of, uh, I think to the, to the gentleman before me who was speaking, it had a lot of stuff built into the NLG engine that really shouldn't be there. You know, we, uh, we, were, we were building charts and graphs and we were uh, putting uh, corrections to information in that and sort of figuring out error correction and doing a bunch of stuff. So we use this as an opportunity to sort of deassemble all of that and really take out all the things that we put in in the first phase out of the core language writing capability. We didn't fundamentally change it in any way other than we disassembled what they call the synonym engine because we wanted to have the ability to have the users or, or business lines create both synonyms in their own language. So if it was written by one uh, team, it would sound like X, and if it was written by like another team, it would sound like Y. But so we were able to sort of disassemble it. We added to it, we added uh, some more uh, industries to it. Um, and uh, again, um, pretty successful. The writing is about, when you machine write, it's about 80% reduction in human uh, capital. Um, we, you know, we, it becomes more of an edit review process than a construction process. Um, and so I think we were able to sort of uh, accomplish a lot with that. But again, we were still having adoption problems. You know, adoption within the firm was difficult. Uh, people were struggling to see how do you take uh, a level of complexity in human writing and human thinking and sort of hand that over to this very rule-driven machine, right? Uh, and honestly, we agree. You know, so uh, we were sort of knowledgeable enough or, or aware enough of our own limitations. Um, and a lot of that was driven by sort of the TOGAF work that we had done, the, you know, the target architecture work we had done. Sort of, sort of knew that we were sort of at the boundaries. So, so. Uh, so I think we've talked about this to a great extent. Um, but what we knew was that we had a world of data not just the US, but the world of data across 24 countries. Um, and what was instinctive to us was that we wanted a machine who could self-discover, self-aware, you know, and uh, be able to sort of look at a set of data and say, hey, I've seen this kind of thing before. If 
if I apply these rules and these rules, you know, could I get to a point where I don't have to hardwire the road to the data? Um, because I think that's ultimately the way most of these commercial products work. Um, so we started thinking and uh, we started doing uh, uh, more work around capabilities, um, where we wanted to go, and uh, so we went to the, go to the next slide. So we started breaking down our models. We looked at you know market share. We and we started. We did a uh, an exercise where we went out to the business and said, "Hey, you know, we'll write anything you want. We won't charge you anything, um, and uh, we want to see how much we can flex this engine." So we had people who asked us to write about market share, who asked us to write about time series, about product mix, about how revenue is is generated, um, and we just kept writing and doing more and more projects. Each one was iterative. We followed the TOGAF principles around a four-week iterative process. And then ultimately, what we did was we sort of found the boundaries of the technology. We found sort of where things were, when did we, where, when did we start to get repetitive, right? And, but for each of these cases, we had to build a separate data model a separate logic model, uh, and ultimately a separate product. Um, and um, so as we started to do this, we started to realize how much inefficiency in the construction process there was, and how much uh, cost there would be to sort of maintain all of this. So, um, and uh, you know, it wasn't really, we had gone from being sort of bleeding edge to being just sort of an system that required a lot of support and effort, right? So, yeah, next slide. So, what we did was uh, we wanted to build out a different way to look at NLG. Um, and what that required us to do then was to sort of say, to look at the four ma major commercial products in the space, um, all of which we're doing, uh, all had big financial service clients, big cosmetic clients, you know, different things, but they were doing the same thing we were doing, you know. Almost all of them were sort of iterating, how, how do I, you know, some of them were getting to a point where they were saying, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll write a draft for you, and then if you don't like what, a draft, what the draft is, you can sort of modify some of the drivers, and then I'll write a new draft for you. But at, at the end of the day, it was the same engine, the same value chain. So we were, we were struggling. So um, we took a, a break from the, from the commercial products. Um, and at about this time, um, one of the things that happened for me personally and I think for my team was that we had sort of carved out the space and sort of, and, and at Moody's in kind of a strange way kind of took over uh, this section of our innovation um, capabilities. And so lots of new opportunities were availing themselves to us. We were getting invited to a lot of machine learning. We were getting invited to a lot of natural language processing. I somehow convinced uh, the executives to give me a bunch of money to go fund research for one of the top uh, natural language uh, universities in the country. Um, and uh, so that all went on. And so we started to develop a broader context, right? We started to think a little bit bigger than this one technology. So if you go to the next level. Um, and that is really what drove us to sort of think about things differently. You know, we started thinking about BI for the first time. We started thinking about data modeling. We started thinking about, you know, well, what if someone in, uh, is, uh, what if a reporter is writing about something that supports the point we're making? Should we try to connect that external? Um, what about our analysts who write all day long and, you know, are uh, writing an unrelated research? Should we be able to sort of grab that and pull that in? Can we take machine-based insights and human-based insights and blend them into a hybrid? Um, those became sort of all the, those kind of questions sort of opened up to us. You go to the next one. So we started looking uh, at hybriding uh, NLG with NLP. 
NLP, with machine learning, with NLU, uh, natural language understanding, natural language processing, machine learning. And we said, okay, well, let's, let's try to build something that is self-aware, but yet uh, still um, uh, have the fundamentals of what we've already accomplished. Good thing. So uh, thanks to, thanks to uh, our, uh, our friends uh, at the academic, academic um, institution that you know, uh, were current PhD students trying to solve big issues, you know, they really encouraged us to look at the sentence itself, to think a little bit about the sentence structure and sort of how you actually write a sentence, right? You know, so you have the metric, um, which is what you're going to essentially write about. You have this ratio, this data point, um, and then ultimately you have the ontology, which is sort of, you know, what is the subject matter, um, and how does that ontology influence sort of the outcome, um, and then ultimately the semantics, which is what we have historically called um, synonyms, but it's, it's, it's now broadened to, to include all the different aspects of the sentence itself. So this ontology approach was not existent in any of the commercial products. You know, the, the ability to sort of, because we kept asking the question of, well, why do I have to build a model? Why can't you figure out, you know, I've written about this thing before, um, why can't you figure that out? So now, what we're saying, what we said was we wanted to break all these four pieces out, and we wanted to build technology stacks around them, right? Um, and that's uh, where we ended up going. If you go to the next slide. So, um, analytic models, we let each of the pieces do what they do and we let them do what they do well. Uh, so the modeling exercises uh, were uh, important in terms of drawing these insights, but the insights are not narrative oriented, the insights are within the data itself. We then use ontology um, to sort of look for properties within the, within the data set because not all industries are the same, not all, I mean, the, you know, you know what, Company A's revenue is might be more of a driver given that its market is uh, large and they own a large market share in that market versus company B who is in a smaller market um, and maybe a mainstream player, right? So we looked at we looked at that and then we looked at sort of building out and we're still in this process of building out what is our style of writing, what is our consistent style of writing that we want to drive through the firm. Uh, so we look at things like uh, copy edit. We are you, we are building a product that um, is based on open source projects that are you know just um, publishing now. Um, and so we're trying to blend all of that together. And when you think about doing the, all those types of things, you're really solving 50, 60 problems all at once with different teams focusing on. Um, and so, you know, you think about sort of that kind of movement um, and being able to understand how close you're getting to getting that man on the moon. What you end up having to do is have a framework uh, to be able to sort of describe, you know, how close are you getting to that end state? And when, 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 when were you gonna, are you going to be ready to sort of pull it together um, and slow the teams down to sort of start that integration assembly process. Um, and Tobias has been uh, important, probably the most important uh, part of how we do that because, you know, we know where we are with data, we know where we are with our capabilities, and we know where we are um, with our ability to um, manage and, uh, and, and uh, in many ways, crunch, crunch that. Um, so, you know, this, this is sort of an example of how it all lays out. Uh, I think the point I was making about revenue, you know, the, the you know, whether I'm talking about hardware revenue or software revenue, um, you know, analytic models. So all of this work is sort of ongoing. And because the firm is, is doing these things, not just for us, but for 
for the business itself and trying to move us forward, particularly in the analytic modeling space. Um, we are uh, not a, you know, we, we're not really a driver there, right? So um, semantics, we're a driver. Data and ontology, uh, the data side, we're not such a driver, but the ontology side, we are. So, you know, like I said in the, uh, previously, you, you need a way to sort of figure out where these are going. A lot of these have three to five year roadmaps. Um, and so, you know, we need to figure out at which point um, it, through the process, you know, we can kind of take a pause and sort of see where, how we're doing against the, our overall roadmap. Um, but as I said at the beginning, uh, you know, we, uh, we would like to see, uh, and we are seeing it now for the first time, machine written content that, you know, can compete with humans. You know, that's sort of our, our, our end game. And so the only way you can do that is, is by looking, this is how our brains work. This is how we think about it. We do analytic work. Um, we do, in order to do that analytic work, we do modeling work, we set up models, we think about those models, we think about how it all pulls together. Um, semantics is a sort of an unknown. I mean, we don't really, most of us, except for people who are in the editing business, you know, the writers typically don't necessarily think semantically um, about, you know, there is a certain stream of conscious for some writers, some writers write in sort of an outline form. Um, so there isn't really this way to sort of do that. But what we do, what we can do is create, what the human brain does is create connection between what we're writing about and what we're exploring and what we're researching, right? So, uh, and that's what ontology really does for us. It's, it's, it's a super powerful way of interconnecting everything that's in the external world in a way that we would interconnect it in our minds, right? So, you know, uh, when you look, when you take sort of a DNA approach to writing a sentence, you know, what, what we have found, and I think what research has found, you know, most organizations are not so atypical as that, that there is only really a finite number of ways that you express yourself, right? So the core, you know, when you look at a sentence, the, the sentence itself is, uh, it, is, uh, it is decorated by rich language, right? But the core sentence, most, most people or most companies express themselves in about 300 uniquely structured sentences, or 3,000 uniquely structured sentences. Um, we think we're a little bit closer to 2,000. Um, and so by looking at that sentence and looking at that core sentence and figuring out how to build that out, and then how to flavor that with rich language, how to flavor that with insights coming from the market, insights coming from other places within your enterprise, um, and you know, assembling that sentence um, to, uh, in a way that you uh, have maybe flavored it in the past, using machine learning to sort of say, okay, you know, this, this can be expanded in the following ways. These are how you might do transitions across sentences, across thoughts, um, you know, machine learning is, is very good with that. So we're seeing a lot of development in that area. And so if we go to the next slide, um, you know, I think we go back. So uh, what we are attempting to do now, and I think in our third generation of this capability, is we're trying to attempt to do what I think what they tried to do with the, with the uh, self-driving. You know, we, you have to know what's in front of you, you have to know what's in back of you, you have to know what your speed is relative to the quality of the road. You know, there are a number of problems, statements that you're trying to solve. So, um, you know, in the 24 month cycle of, from the beginning of this year to uh, the end of next year, um, we, you know, we have a number of milestones that we're trying to accomplish. Um, we've already accomplished some of them. Um, to give some examples, the ability to figure out if a sentence is active or passive, and if it's passive, how to make it active, um, which is important when you're writing externally facing material. Um, we are pulling, uh, we have been very fortunate, and I, I, I want to just compliment 
the European vendors. We work with about three European vendors. And for some reason, I think, I can't figure this out, but I don't want to put down American vendors, but it, it, the European vendors seem to be much more uh, able to take the intellectual challenge that we sort of give them and come up with new ways. So we have, we chose uh, an NLG provider here in, in Europe, um, and we came to them and said, look, your product just isn't going to make it, and here are, we wrote sort of our own manifesto of what we thought natural language should be and what it should do. Um, and uh, over a course of maybe two or three meetings, we were able to convince them, um, and they're going to fundamentally change their product. So I think what we've been able to do through, and I think the documents and what we showed them was really very TOGAF centric. Um, you know, it was it allowed their PhDs and thinkers to sort of get inside of us in our heads and what we were trying to do. And now, if Moody's is successful as well, this vendor will likely own the market, right? Um, and so it's been, uh, it's been an, uh, an amazing exercise, I think, for them. Um, and what they didn't even know was they had PhDs that were working for them that had worked on problems uh, in university, um, and, they were, and they were sort of foregoing these very interesting problems in order to work uh, on the product that they had in front of them. So, you know, not only has the thinking sort of evolved in our internal organizations, it's evolved there as well. So, um, so this is our goal, and uh, hopefully in a couple of years, I'll, I'll get to tell you if we accomplished it. decomposition of a sentence and, and the, uh, the words that were said, that was interesting. Um, so as you would expect with this audience of people who are interested in the TOGAP side of things, yeah, yeah, yeah. Around, I know there'll be yeah. more on that tomorrow, but, yes. but um, one specific that you mentioned was um, a four-week iterative process yes. in, in using TOGAP. Now one of the things that people say about TOGAP and infrared architecture generally is, oh, isn't that slow, isn't it? waterfall only, and clearly there are people who know how to do it in a more agile way. Can you say a bit more about how you did it? Uh, well, I, I think it, you have to, in order to do this kind of work, um, it, you have to sort of figure out what you're, every time we do one of these, we want to do something that's different, something we haven't done in the past, right? Because I think, you know, when you look at sort of a, uh, uh, target state architecture and you say to yourself, oh, this will cover the world, but you know, the real world is out there, right? You know, and so um, you know, we have to we have to have a way uh, to be able to look at the real world. It's in a very it's in a very lab oriented exercise. I mean we have two or three going on every day. Uh, and we, we go in four week increments. Um, but um, it wasn't so difficult. What was difficult was to give up, you know, the old legacy um, things. You know, uh, I don't have. Where's my business requirement document? Where's my functional requirement document? And to start thinking more conceptually, thinking, you know, more at, you know, you know, why is this not like everything else we've done? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, do you have plans for adaptation of content to a reader's viewpoint? For example, different articles written for a Republican or a Democratic audience. Well, I, I think the ultimate, uh, the the ultimate end game, I mean, really, is to be able to have a conversation uh, with a machine. I mean, you look at sort of, uh, you look at web design today, there's responsive design, but really, the most, uh, I think, the most important thing, or the the best end game, would be, I have. Microsoft has Amelia or whoever you have. Yeah, I have an interface that you know I can converse with, right? You know, right out of uh, what was it, 2000 with the 2000? Yeah, right, exactly. I mean, so you know, being able to curate a conversation that's based on the feedback of the person you're conversing with is the ultimate. Is the, is the ultimate. Well, the machine. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, can you say a little bit? Um, about the um, 
the individuals who work on these work on these projects, their, their kind of backgrounds, their their skill sets. Is it a, is it a mix um, of sort of very technical people and you talked specifically about some academic work? But what kind of folks are involved in these projects? Or does it does it vary? Well, it's an interesting question. When we first started, the business was not it was not overly interested. Um, so we had a, we, we had a difficult time getting them along. But we had because of the work that we do, we had a very good network of some good thinkers in the business, and we said, hey, well, would this be useful? Would that be useful? And so you know, they they were helpful. But I would say most of it was IT driven um, in the beginning, uh, and um, you know somewhere along the line the the light bulb went on when we started to get a little bit ahead uh, and defining our own requirements, defining our own capabilities, and then I think what happened was, you know, there was a little bit of a good uh, a good conflict that resulted in them really taking ownership and sort of along with us. So um, in the beginning we didn't have a lot of strong business um, interest, but it, we're, it's completely different now. The business is uh, is driving more uh, honestly than than on our side of But uh, uh, data, um, you know, I think honestly for me, you know, having the data, understanding the data, you know, financial data, ratings data is, is somewhat unique. Um, you know, I think that's fairly big. For me, the other thing is academia. I spent a lot of time with academia. I spent a lot of time trying to network with people who are doing things. There was a, a, a but there was a, a gentleman who uh, worked in Colorado, his name uh, is Zach Tout, who wrote the fifth book in the Game of Thrones through machine learning. You know, just to give an example of sort of how serious they could take this. Uh, I hired him uh, for two weeks to come in and talk to us about what he had achieved. Um, it really, uh, you know, uh, so he came in and we talked a little bit about we were looking at his models. And we looked at it, you know, we shared it with some of our academic, academia partners. You know, there were certain things that were, you know, honestly, probably um, not very well thought through, but there were some things that he accomplished that, you know, were kind of interesting to us. So, um, but we are constantly monitoring. So that monitoring process requires some special skills, um, but, you know, it's, we're always looking for some, some kind of edge to kind of Group that forward. Clearly, our architecture folks. We have uh, uh, both integrator and integrated architect. Um, we have uh, I know, I know Peter Haviland, uh, who's been very involved. Um, so it's uh, but but I think really it's more people who can work, who can change the way they work and the way they think, and sort of oh I eat, we're doing it this way, you know, and now we're going to do it some other some other way. So I think it's. <laughs> The adaptability and sort of not get locked into a set of facts. Right. Because the set of facts is just constantly changing. Uh, when applying NLG in an enterprise, what are the key barriers to breakthrough and how do you best prepare for those? Well, people don't like to be replaced by a machine. That's the thing. <laughs> uh, and we don't really look at it that way. I mean, honestly, it's, you know, the question is, and it's the same thing we, you know, that was being said when ERP was big in the 90s, you know, that, you know, we're spending too much time on the things we shouldn't be spending time on, right? And so, you know, um, being able to show a couple things. Um, one is, you know, I'm a big believer in product. You know, you gotta get product out there. I mean, I, you know, every four weeks we produce something that's good. I, you know, I'm like a script, trying to sell my script. I'm like walking around the building, like, have you seen this? You know, talking to MDs all the time, you know, trying to get people to sort of realize, you know, what we're doing and how we're advancing. Um, and I think that that's really, honestly, I think one one side of it's we've been able to we've been able to hunt people in the business who have an idea that aren't being heard, um, and we've been able to as well uh, match that with technical capabilities. And I think you know now. Um, We've become as much sort of, I, I would consider as, as much sort of matchmaker or even like a, a venture capitalist firm internally or right, to, to, try to, to try to do things like that. Together. Okay, uh, how long does it take to develop a new cognitive model? Is it days, months, years? Uh, well, uh, my 
counterpart in the back, Vince tomorrow will tell you it's 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 very quick. Um, we did a uh, we did a we did a, uh, a model just recently. Well, we've done a couple where we brought people in. Um, I think what we'd like to be able to do is bring more people into it because you know what happens is in technology is you get sort of a certain acceleration in one area, everyone else gets left behind. You know. Uh, budgets and all, all kinds of things. So what we have to do is we sort of encourage all the other teams to sort of get involved. Um, so we had a woman who uh, I asked, to, she was a BA, I asked her to write up um, the, some stuff that we had done through machine learning around figuring out weights and factors, right? You know, you, know, you have this outcome, but what really drove it? So, um, and so she did that. We kind of shopped it around. It went all, it went all the way up to the high levels, um, to the CIO and other folks. And unbeknownst to me, uh, two weeks later, she came back and she said, you know, I've been exploring some of these. I, I, I created an Amazon account uh, and, you know, I mocked up some data and I, you know, looked at, you know, looking at things by rating class. You know, or looking at it at a finer level, or looking at cities under a million population and sort of applying that same technology. She built a model in two weeks and uh, it's, it has some very impressive insights. Yeah, so, and she's not even, a, she's not even, she's not a developer. She's, she's a BA, right? So, I mean, I think the accessibility of technology is, 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 is in such a big way. And, you know, I know people like to talk about the millennials, but you know, we have two, I think, you know, we have some very good and gifted developers under 30, which is great, but some of the biggest uh, accomplishments have been uh, in the, uh, I mean, I think an equal number of accomplishments have been in our plus 50 group, you know, and uh, so it's very interesting, you know, the, 50, the plus 50s are more disruptive, you know, <laughs> they're like, I'm tired of doing it this way, I don't want to do it this way anymore. Okay, so last question. Yeah. How, how did you obtain the data model and the ontology experts that you needed? Uh, well, we, uh, the data model, we, we definitely used, we have, a, we have a fairly large data team within, within their use, so that, that was less of an issue. And we have spent, I mean, if you really think about what we've done, we've spent the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 years building out models to sort of help us do what we do. So the modeling is sort of not, was not such a, uh, a thing, but you know, we were really influenced by Mongo, right? You know, Mongo came in a couple of years ago and really started looking at this sort of the use cases of Mongo and sort of what people have been able to do in Mongo and that really started the thinking around ontology. Uh, we have ultimately kind of gone in a slightly different direction there. Um, but I think, you know, being influenced by what we saw in the market um, and sort of the NoSQL space was really, I think, yeah, Okay. We'll let people get, get coffee and we'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You.